The ninth question we ask ourselves when doing educational analysis has to do with the different kinds of levels that exist within the education system as a whole. Now, this is a crucial question because up until now, we've really been focusing in at the heartland of where teaching and learning happens in the classroom between the teacher and the students. And we haven't broadened our perspective. We haven't lifted our heads, as it were, to take a look at, at the whole system of education and how it operates. So I would like to try and give you a very quick introduction as to how it works. And to do that, I'm going to work with two basic uh, principles. The first one is I'm going to describe how levels in education work at the simplest level. And secondly, I'm going to talk about the logic of transformation, which happens as you move through the levels. And the other principle is, is that things have to change as you move from one level to the other. But at the same time, you have to keep something similar. Uh, I will then try and embed uh, the discussion in, a, in, in an example, which will show you how you work through the levels in education. So let's start off with a really basic picture of what uh, educational levels are. And let's start right at the top with that uh, blue kind of uh, esoteric question mark, and that represents uh, the finding of new knowledge, the generation of new knowledge that out there which hasn't yet been discovered but which is about to be. Now that's a wonderfully creative, fertile, difficult uh, space to be in uh, and only a very few people uh, actually manage to get beyond that space or, or into that space. Uh, a lot of the people who aspire to that space are actually just um, before that um, in that kind of dark black level right at the top. They would love to make the breakthrough into new knowledge, but they're just not going to do it. Uh, that's left to the lucky few. But the point is, is, is that when new knowledge is actually discovered, uh, it has to then be made sense of. And the place it initially gets made sense of is within the university sphere, is in the sphere of the top research organizations which distribute the research and show what its importance is. Now, the level that that operates on is a very different level to what's going on at the uh, school level. Uh, we're talking about high level stuff which hardly anyone understands but the very few people engaged in that research at the top level. But the point is, is that this new knowledge which is generated and the highest forms of knowledge, that esoteric knowledge uh, that uh, the world uses to produce new knowledge and uh, revolutions in the way that we work with our world, well, uh, that knowledge has to find its way down through the system to the point where the basics of that knowledge, the parts of that knowledge that uh, are dependent on prior structures, uh, the earlier levels that knowledge needs in order for it to have got to the point where it got to, well, we have to make sure that we create the grounds for that uh, breakthrough in knowledge to happen. And this shifts us onto the second level. And in that second level, what happens is there's the question of how do we take the knowledge of the world and recontextualize it, rework it, rejig it so that it becomes understandable to our learners and our students. It's a very difficult and complex question because you have to transform the way that the knowledge works uh, from its esoteric uh, abstract essence into a situation where you start to say, how do we get it into the schools? How do we get the teachers to teach this stuff? How do we clarify what the curriculum is? Um, and uh, that second level is the space where organizations like the Department of Education uh, start to ask questions about how to take the knowledge of the world and condense it and formalize it and standardize it so that the learners can actually learn and the teachers can actually teach it. And this then takes us down to the third level, and that's the level where the actual teaching and learning of the basics happens. Uh, that's where uh, teachers and learners uh, follow, to a large extent, what the definitions of the curriculum were, 
which are given to them by the second devil, and then it's taught, and then it's learnt. And the hope is, as we move up now to those uh, brown arrows, the hope is, is, is that when the uh, learners learn that basic knowledge, that's going to enable them to get one level higher, where they enter the university level, where they enter the level where they're reaching, slowly reaching the heights of knowledge, and eventually they break through into the third level, where they are really at the heights of knowledge, and hopefully will actually break through into new knowledge. Obviously, that's only destined for uh, a few people to reach that level. Many of us will engage in the process of just reproducing our lives, reproducing our families, and reproducing our existence. Now, that gives you a very basic account of the three levels of education. The top level, where new knowledge is uh, made. Uh, the second level, where the new knowledge is recontextualized into an understandable and mass producible form that can go out to all the schools in, in, in a country. And then the third level where the actual teaching and learning of that uh, knowledge takes place. Um, now the second uh, key principle that I'd like you to understand in terms of working with the levels of education is the, the really interesting feature that when you move through the levels, you have to change, you have to transform, you have to manipulate because you're shifting from one context and one set of expectations to another context and another set of expectations. In the process of doing that, what existed at the one level has to transform itself and change when it goes to the second level. Now, the way I've tried to catch this is through a, a really simple but elegant um, picture where on the left hand side at the top what you'll see is you'll see a donut and that donut has got a hole in it. Now what's going to happen is that donut is going to slowly but surely transform into a cup. Very different to a donut. Uh, a, a, a very different manifestation of that of that shape but interestingly if you look carefully you'll see that actually on another level they are the same kind of shape because they've only got one hole in it uh, and that hole of the donut stays in the hole in the handle of the cup uh, and so you have a situation where at the same time as transforming something you try to keep it the same and that is the central question that occupies the educational system now, to try and demonstrate this, I used a, a, a rendition of Raphael's graces in my book, Cracking the Code to Educational Research. And what you'll see on the right-hand side is a beautiful uh, woman holding uh, the donut. And what I take that to be is that first level I talked about, the level where new knowledge is produced. And she's contemplating it, she's looking at it in her own terms. But she is attached to another woman who is looking at the beginnings of the transformation of that donut into a cup. Uh, and there the question is of recontextualization, of how do I transform the donut slowly but surely into something which can actually be uh, digested and taught. And there you see the final result in the third woman who is holding a cup. Uh, I'd say it's a cup of knowledge which you can drink from, uh, which you can take sustenance from, and she is concentrated on that cup itself. But notice the three of them are intimately linked together, each attending to their own object, but each connected to the other. And there's a transformation that happens from the production of new knowledge all the way down to where the reproduction of teaching and learning happens. But at the same time, as something has radically transformed in terms of the way the knowledge is actually presented, something about it has kept the same. Now to illustrate this, let's take a look at a, a, a quick example. Um, and let's use the Industrial Revolution. It's a favorite example of mine. Uh, and let's start off with the production of new knowledge. And, and one of the dudes that managed to, one of the few people in, in the massive amount of humanity that's actually been born, over the ages that broke through into something new was James Watt 
And uh, what he did was he developed a, a new way for steam engines to work. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it, he actually turned it into a patent. And from that patent, uh, he made a lot of money. And from and from the steam engine, the whole industrial revolution was partly spawned. Now, in that radical production of new knowledge, that first level make sense of what's going on in terms of the Industrial Revolution in a highly academic way. Now take a look at this journal article which is written by Gregory Clark and Ace Brand van der Waff. And notice firstly, the title isn't even the Industrial Revolution, it's the Industrious Revolution. Notice also that every single sentence is carefully justified, carefully argued for, carefully dated, uh, carefully referenced. Um, so you have a situation where you're working in the esoteric level, where not only is everything difficult, but you have to defend uh, and be exact and precise about every single move you make, because it's under interrogation by the other people who are at the top of that level. But the knowledge which is produced at that top level uh, then has to go through a situation where it becomes transformed, it becomes manipulated, it becomes recontextualized so that it can actually be used in schools. And the task of that falls to major, big national and international organizations which attempt to twist the, the new knowledge into a form which children and teachers can digest. And what you can see here is you can see a, a curriculum statement taken from a South African, um, uh, the CAPS, the, actually it's curriculum 2005, I think, in which they're trying to give an account of how you're going to take that history knowledge and teach it to the uh, students. Notice that they've got all sorts of issues to do with the learning outcomes, assessment standards, contents and contexts. And you're going to struggle in this document to actually find very much about the Industrial Revolution, although it is in there and it is specified, but in general ways. A lot of the time is spent explaining uh, what the purpose of history is, why it's important to study history, what the assessment standards are and what the learning outcomes are. Now, a teacher at the third level gets hold of the curriculum statement and then transforms it into something which can be taught and learned. Now notice how radically different this is from that journal article uh, which uh, we showed earlier. Over here everything is simplified, uh, everything is told in very ex uh, clear um, but iconic terms. The Industrial Revolution uh, the farmers are reduced to one person farming, industry is reduced to one person in industry. Um, the, all the changes are caught in eight little bubbles, uh, all of which have an amazingly simplified account. So when working with question nine in terms of educational analysis, um, firstly ask yourself what are the levels of education and work with three basic levels in your um, analytical work. Uh, a level where the production of knowledge happens, a level where the knowledge is recontextualized into teachable form, and then a third level where that knowledge is reproduced and taught in a way which learners and teachers can actually handle and work with. Uh, never forget that uh, that situation has to then move upwards where the learners have to get to a situation where they are enabled to become the new producers of knowledge in the system. Um, and secondly, always bear in mind that you're working with transformation where you have to radically rework uh, what the knowledge is because you're shifting into different contexts as you shift into different levels and that transforms things radically, but you have to keep a golden chain where the actual knowledge that you're working with remains so that when you move up the levels, you can track that chain all the way to the place where you can actually produce new knowledge.